Okay, here we are again. Uh, Going to continue with our blood chapter. Let's get into the idea now of platelets. So up to this point, uh, we've learned about the red blood cells, uh, the leukocytes, the different types, granulocytes, agranulocytes. We know now a little bit about the uh, sort of homeostatic imbalances of not enough white blood cells, too many white blood cells, or leukopenia, or leukemias. Now we progress to uh, another important part of our blood, another formed element of the blood. Uh, we're going to look at the thrombocytes, um, also known as platelets, more commonly known as platelets. So um, we initiate discussion by kind of emphasizing that platelets are not complete cells. So they are considered formed elements, uh, but they are not actually complete cells. They are fragments of cells. They're cytoplasmic fragments of a very large cell called megakaryocytes. So important, important for the homework. Your megakaryocytes are the precursors then to the red blood cells. They're also precursors to the white blood cells and now to the platelets. So the role of these cytoplasmic fragments, think of them as crumbs, crumbs of, the, of this big cell. Uh, they're gonna help to uh, stop bleeding and we call that hemostasis. They're involved in the hemostatic processes uh, that will lead to blood clotting. So without, uh, without platelets, basically we can't have effective uh, clotting there. Let's shut this down. So looking now at the idea of uh, hemostasis, um, again, platelets are gonna have granules containing chemicals that act in the clotting process. So these granules, that we saw in the white blood cells, which are gonna help in immunity. Now these uh, granules are gonna basically have a different role for clotting. So kind of a developmental pathway here. We have this large hemocytoblast. There's a megakaryoblast, pro-megakaryocyte, this big, mega big nucleus cell, megakaryocyte, a large nuclear cell. And, and if you notice, it's just little fragments, little phospholipid bilayer enclosed a little uh, bit of cytoplasm that breaks off of this megakaryocyte. So uh, again, the precursor to all formed elements, and then more specifically, the cell that fragments off these platelets with granules, um, and that's again the, the basis for our clotting uh, little thrombocyte there. So again, not a true cell. So blood clotting, blood clot is a network of thread-like protein fibers called fibrin. So when you talk about a blood clot, I want you to start utilizing the term fibrin. Fibrin is the actual mechanism, is the molecule that actually clots the blood. Um, the formation of blood clot depends on a number of proteins called coagulation factors and calcium. Uh, it should be double positive there. So coagulation factors are going to be little proteins that are also found within the blood um, that will cascade in one of two paths that kind of like a domino effect, they cascade one protein uh, becomes functional and catalyzes another protein, another reaction, and eventually ending up at this molecule we call fibrin, the clot itself. Uh, two clotting pathways, and again, this can get super detailed. I don't want to get too bogged down with the individual factors. I, I just want you to kind of have an idea of what is trying to accomplish, what the body is trying to accomplish with this. So uh, the final product, the final fibrin molecule is the same. It's just going to be initiated in, in a different way, and um, basically they're going to be uh, triggered at the same time, right? So looking at our extrinsic clotting pathway and intrinsic. I don't know if you understand the terms extrinsic, sort of external, uh, intrinsic, internal. So external and internal to what, right? So let's kind of uh, apply that sort of context here. So both the extrinsic and the intrinsic clotting pathways uh, are triggered simultaneously during tissue damage um, and, and again, yes, they're two separate things, but realistically, practically, 
uh, they're going to both happen at the same time and lead to the same result. So tissue factors. Um, uh, factor one, two, three, four, five, six. So these are the factor numbers. And in essence, what are the factors themselves? Well, the factors are proteins, plasma proteins, glycoproteins, ions, protein, 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 protein. So again, most of the factors are actual proteins, right? And they're gonna have different names, fibrogen, prothrombin, tissue factor, uh, procellarin. Um, and one thing that makes this a little bit confusing the factors are named in the sequence in which they were discovered. So factor one was found first. So they gave it oh, the first factor. Factor two was this one, factor three, but that's not the sequence in which they actually work. So the sequence is kind of jumbled up, um, which makes it a little bit confusing. But again, we're not gonna get bogged in so many details. Uh, the, the take home message, these factors, are actual proteins. They have specific names, they have specific roles in the pathway. Uh, something of, of relevance is the source. So yes, we're talking about blood, but most of these proteins are gonna be derived from the liver, right? So liver, 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 uh, bone marrow, uh, the plasma itself, and tissue cells, right? So, the majority of these clotting factors found in uh, circulation are produced by the liver. So it uh, gives you a, an insight as to how critical your liver is, right? So liver does a lot of detoxifying. Uh, it's gonna help with digestion, and it also helps then with blood clotting. So if a person is dealing with hepatitis, some sort of liver cirrhosis, it's going to be a lot of secondary complications and clotting would be one of those secondary complications, right? So, um, I'll elaborate a little bit on these. Again, I don't want to get too bogged down in all the little details, but um, extrinsic, extrinsic, I want you to kind of associate with tissue factor. Tissue factor, which is factor three. So factor three, tissue factor derived from actual tissue cells. So not coming from the liver, this one coming from the actual cells that are being damaged. So uh, extrinsic factor, which are chemicals extrinsic to the blood. So normally they're in the cells. They're not normally in the blood. When the cells become damaged, these extrinsic factors uh, enter into the bloodstream. So that's why they call it extrinsic. Intrinsic pathway is initiated by chemicals inside the blood responding to exposed collagen fibers and damaged blood vessels. So the intrinsic uh, factor here, collagen, is inside of the, of the blood vessel itself, right? So um, uh, let's see, the best way I can, the best analogy I can give you, if you can, if you can envision uh, let's say your your wall right now, the wall in your house. Um, behind the wall, there's insulation, but you don't see that insulation unless there's damage to the to the wall itself, right? So, imagine uh, insulation inside of your wall, kind of like like the collagen. So, we're not gonna ever be exposed to that unless there's trauma to the blood vessel itself. If the blood vessel itself is traumatized, is damaged, uh, then the blood itself, the plasma itself, is uh, going to be exposed to that uh, collagen. So it's inside of the blood uh, vessel, so we call it intrinsic. The extrinsic tissue factor is not even in the blood vessel, it's out in the cells outside somewhere else. So that's the derivative of, of these. Um, so let me just kind of try to elaborate here. So intrinsic, the collagen inside the blood vessel, once the vessel is torn, blood comes into contact with the collagen, and then we start our clotting cascade. One catalyzes one, catalyzes the other, catalyzes the other, um, and we work our way down to prothrombin activator. Well, a similar factor happens once the tissue is 
releasing this tissue factor, damaged tissue releasing tissue factor. So we start this pathway. And if you notice, we end up at the same molecule, a prothrombin activator. So it doesn't really matter which cascade we follow, intrinsic or extrinsic, we end up at the same molecule. So that's the goal. That's the purpose of both of these pathways, to get to the prothrombin activator. And once we're at the prothrombin activator, then we continue down a singular path uh, to our fibrin mesh here. So again, so we get to prothrombin activator. We have to get to that point. Uh, then we uh, react again to make thrombin. Uh, fibrinogen catalyzes the production then of the fibrin. So that's the goal. We finally got to our clotting mechanism here, right? The fibrin itself. Um, so a lot of detail again, but it's kind of, for our, for our purposes, an introductory anatomy course, we want to know, did the blood clot? That's the critical aspect here. Uh, just of trivial note here, not necessarily trivial, but factor eight. Uh, this factor eight is of uh, relevance. There's a genetic uh, condition. I don't know if you've heard of hemophilia. Hemophilia is the, um, the genetic disease in which uh, factor eight is not produced. So a person born with hemophilia uh, doesn't have the protein that's produced. They're, they lack the genetic sequence. Uh, the liver is not producing then this factor eight. So they would have what we call hemophilia. If you have factor eight, that means you don't have hemophilia. If you don't have factor eight, the anti-hemolytic factor, then you're going to have a very difficult time um, initiating the, uh, the intrinsic pathway to, to clot. But again, there can still be clotting via the uh, extrinsic pathway. But again, it would have to be triggered by direct trauma to the, to the cells. So uh, what is this fibrin mesh that we're talking about? Right? Think of it as a very sticky spider web. Right? It's, it's very analogous to spider webs. So we have this fibrin sticky network that starts to adhere and stick to all of these red blood cells. So Imagine you have a hole, you have a tear, red blood cells and plasma are leaking out. So now this fibrin mesh covers that hole. It starts to slow down the, the loss of red blood cells and starts to create a big traffic jam. Right? So uh, if you notice when there's bleeding, or as you say, when, when, when there's a cut, um, starts to, to clot, uh, we stop seeing the red fluid. We start seeing the, the red blood cells leaking out. And then for a little while, we start to see that, uh, that clear yellow plasma that, that leaks out. Right? And eventually, uh, again, that, that clear yellow plasma would leak out until eventually we make more and more and more fibrin until all of that then is trapped in. So again, we need to be able to clot when there's a damage, when there's trauma. Uh, we're talking about some hemostatic disorders now, uh, thromboembolytic conditions. So these are not things that you want. These are not normal hemostatic uh, situations. So a thrombus. So thrombus uh, is, is defined in a couple of ways, right? So this is a blood clot that develops. Okay, one, it developed normally. It should have developed. Let's say there was trauma. The thrombus uh, was formed. Okay, now, after it's formed, it's supposed to be sort of disintegrated away. Once the bleeding has stopped, you did your job, uh, we need to get rid of that, uh, that clot inside of the blood vessel, right? Now, if, if it doesn't get dissolved away, it persists, we call that then a thrombus. So one, the thrombus could have developed normally and under normal situations, but then didn't get uh, dissolved. Two, uh, for whatever reason, the clotting cascade is triggered without uh, trauma, without the extrinsic or without the intrinsic pathways being triggered. So um, for whatever reason, the, the, the blood clot formed when it wasn't supposed to. So that's a thrombus. Now the thrombus forms, it clogs the vessel, but it's in one stationary position. It doesn't move. 
if for whatever reason that thrombus then breaks apart, breaks, and now is traveling uh, through circulation, we call that an embolus, an embolism, right? So the embolus is a thrombus, uh, a clot that breaks away from a vessel wall and fro uh, floats freely through the bloodstream. So that it becomes uh, dangerous uh, because it's a large clot that can pass through large vessels, but once it gets to the smaller vessels, smaller diameter vessels, there's a big risk that it can clog those. Um, these uh, traveling thrombi, these emboli, um, are basically the, the reason why people develop strokes. Uh, maybe if it's in the heart, an infarction, if it's in the brain, a cerebral infarction, a stroke. So again, things that you don't want to happen in the body. So this is when we have too much clotting. We've talked about the term penia. So penia is a deficiency. This is the opposite situation. So these are uh, disorders in which the blood is not clotting the way it's supposed to, not clotting uh, at the right amount. So thrombocytopenia, a deficiency in the platelets. So not enough platelets to do their, their, their sufficient job of clotting. Uh, we talked a little bit about the liver. If the liver is damaged, we're not getting enough of the clotting proteins, the factors in, in circulation. And then the genetic disease of hemophilia. So the person is genetically born, uh, they're born with that genetic uh, deficiency, not being able to produce factor eight. So having an impact on the, uh, on the intrinsic pathway there. Okay, so with that, this will conclude our little discussion on platelets, on the thrombocytes. So I'm going to stop this one here uh, so the videos don't get super long and hard to kind of sit through. Um, and I will uh, progress now to transfusions and uh, what else? Transfusions, some of the blood, uh, blood typing, that kind of stuff. I think you'll find that one quite interesting. Right? So let me get to that and I'll see you again shortly.